nice to finally meet you. I know. Like, we did a podcast together and we never actually met. I know. That was a lot of fun, though. Yay, so welcome. Really glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And finally, there's me. I'm Ken Gagne. I am the host of a podcast called Polygamer, which advocates for equality and diversity in gaming. I also have a YouTube channel, GameBits. I'm the editor of the last remaining print publication dedicated to the Apple II computer, currently in its 21st year. And more locally, I'm also on the faculty of the publishing department at Emerson College here in Boston. Any alumni or students here? None? Okay, you all fail. Great, thank you. Okay, so, no clap for the teacher, guys. <laughs> so these are our Twitter handles. You're welcome to follow us or tweet at us. You can also use hashtag PaxJourno, which is in the lower right corner, if you wish to contribute to the discussion while it is being had, I will be following that stream and incorporating your comments into the conversation. There will also be Q&A at the end. So in the meantime, I want to start the conversation by opening up to the panel with the question, how awesome is it to get paid to play video games all day? I wouldn't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What else do, what is there to do? <laughs> okay. what, what, what does a typical day look like for you, Susan? Oh, uh, for me, um, I'm in kind of a, a unique position in that I'm managing a, a team in two countries and three different time zones in the US. Uh, I do a lot of actual editing. I will edit, um, you know, two to ten features a day. Uh, I also, you know, have to, I have to do all the boring stuff like sitting in on budgetary meetings and future planning and, you know, overall strategy. Like right now, when I get back from PAX, we're having a meeting about the brand. What does the brand mean? <laughs> These are the kinds of things that will suck your soul. But they're absolutely necessary and, and part of what makes a website go. And Samit, you are a little bit more on the ground, uh, pounding the pavement, writing stories. What, how do you find all those stories? How many stories are you writing? Uh, it really depends on uh, you know, what the sort of the focus of the week is, because uh, I've also started uh, in the past year or so doing uh, a good amount of entertainment coverage as well. Uh, and I'm, you know, again, at Games Radar, then uh, mm -hmm. start doing entertainment as well. Uh, you're seeing that at a lot of places, and so uh, I'm located in New York, so there's a good amount of that coverage there to be had. And um, for example, uh, I was like just doing regular news stuff, and then like last fall, I got an email from a PR person at Sci-Fi, and they were like, "Hey, would you like a screener with the Magicians, uh, which was which premiered in uh, January?" It's really good. It's, it's pretty, really good. It's pretty good. It's not as good as the books, but it's pretty good. <laughs> oh, oh, I disagree. But anyway, um, but yeah. So uh, you know, I talked to my entertainment editor, uh, Susanna Poe, and I was like, "Hey, uh, they're offering us these screeners. Do you think we could would do recaps or like a review or something?" She's like, "Well, why don't you go for it and see what happens?" And so then I ended up doing recaps of uh, uh, every episode in the first season. And so like that's obviously very different from maybe what a lot of people might be accustomed to or like expect people in uh, like the video game journalism field to do, but um, I think it really varies from hour to hour. And then a, lo a lot of my job is like, okay, you know, there's uh, an interview opportunity for, from a game developer or uh, whatever, and then I'll go talk with those people on Skype or something about uh, their game, or I'll go to a press event in New York City uh, and, and you know, get hands on with the game and you know, talk to developers and things like that. So uh, it's, it's really pretty varied. And over here, both of you have been or are editors. Do you get to do much writing, or are you mostly editing? Um, so I, uh, I don't think, I think in the past maybe year and a half, I've spent maybe, uh, I think two weeks is the most I've actually like been home at any given time, because I'm traveling a lot for this. Um, I know that uh, I, don't, I don't post as much anymore, but usually I'm doing a lot of writing. Like I do a lot of investigative and a lot of long form, so why? While I, you know, may put a preview of like Mafia Three up on one day, uh, you won't hear from me again for another two weeks because I'm LinkedIn stalking people for a story. Mm -hmm. um, so I probably mostly write. That's most of my day. So it takes a long time to stalking write just one article. For if you're doing something investigative, yeah. I know uh, the last big one I did was um, I talked to the people that were working on the canceled Final Fantasy XII spinoff at Grin over in Sweden, and that was about ten months of work. Wow. So. A lot, of, a lot of LinkedIn stalking. I'm really good at stalking people on LinkedIn. <laughs> I don't know if that's like a LinkedIn-worthy skill. So you, so you have the premium account? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Expensive. Huh. 
Because I imagine that a lot of websites, and I've seen this happen, they have a quota of how many articles you need to pump out a day. Because video games is a very fast moving industry. That's how Game Ranks was. I mean, for me, um, you know, I didn't get to be just an editor. I mean, my role was so intensive. And, and so for me, you know, waking up at 6 a.m., the first three hours of my day are spent correcting stories, directing stories, assigning stories, fixing other people's work, then getting to my stories, you know, a quota of six a day. Usually between 6 a.m. to 2 p.m., writing, 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 looking over other people's work, strategizing headlines, uh, directing how the coverage is going to go for any particular article in terms of how thorough it is, backlinking, etc. And then for the rest of the day, maybe four to five hours, I get the game. But even then, there's so many games on my schedule, it becomes very difficult to manage. So, you know, you go look on my Steam account, you'll see how many hours I'm spending. You got about 40 hours, two weeks, maybe 60 if I'm if I'm doing a really good, you know, fortnight. But now that I'm at Pace Magazine. You know, I'm getting paid more, but my workload is completely different, and now I've switched to features instead of just um, news reports and reviews and interviews and that sort of thing. Um, so the focus is, is quite different, where you know I'm instead trying to optimize um, search engine optimization needs just in terms of what's, what's going to be pushed, what's going to get traffic, but also be informative and, and proper for the audience. And so uh, that's, that's what I'm doing over at Pace Magazine now, moving into a, to an editing position later this year, and uh, just a lot of strategy going into it, even as a freelancer doing the features for Pace right now. So, um, you know, I overworked, underpaid, I gotta, that's all I gotta say. <laughs> so. so it sounds like there's a variety of tasks and skills and roles in the video game industry, even just represented right up here on this panel. And I'm curious to know, what is your favorite thing to do at your job? Whether or not you actually do it, or something that you have done or wish you could do, whether it's uh, video production, audio editing, uh, for a podcast, writing a long form feature, editing a freelancer, uh, a particular kind of article you like to write. Why don't we just go right down the line here? Um, so actually, one thing I didn't mention, uh, a lot of my day, I'm, I'm a reporter, but a lot of my day is actually spent copy editing, which is a thing that I enjoy doing because I'm a weird person. <laughs> Uh, Alexa will know this. I know it. I don't think <laughs> but I he's so good at it. I know. <laughs> um, I just happen to be really good at it. Uh, and so a lot of times, you know, people, like my coworkers will just be like, hey, Submit, are you free to look over this thing because it's 3,000 words and I've been working on it for a month and a half and I just can't look at it any longer. So you just make sure that it doesn't make me look like an idiot. Um, and so that's something that, like, I think is maybe a skill that people don't appreciate as much, uh, uh, especially, but the readers will notice if, if it's not there. So uh, I enjoy doing it and I you know, enjoy like sort of you know, filling that role and, and providing that service. Susan? Um, editing, e I mean, easy. You love editing. I do, I love editing. I love, what I do is, in, in addition to basic copy editing, uh, I do substantive editing, which is, you know, taking whatever you've written and said, okay, you haven't quite made your argument, there's no through line, you know, I know what you're going for, but you're not quite connecting the dots enough, and helping the author hone their craft while also making something really, really good. Um, it's, it's kind of a luxury almost in our industry to take something that could run as is, like, yeah, it's good enough, It'll, it won't embarrass us, it's decently written, and then saying, yeah, this is good, but it could be better go make it better. And it's uh, something that doesn't, it just doesn't happen a, a whole lot um, because most places are horribly understaffed. So, you know, taking the time to do that, it just is a straight up luxury. I love getting to do that. I love working with all our writers. I get to work with some immensely talented people who always love the feedback. They're like, yes, please, hack my stuff to ribbons, make it better, make me better at what I do. Because when you get to be a certain level of good, in this industry, people stop touching your work. Because they go, oh yeah, no, this it's fine. It, it's good enough to go, boom. And it's you don't get the opportunity to, to improve a lot because you don't get that critique. So they're they're really, really responsive to it. And I, I love getting to do that. I also, uh, now that we've merged with um, SFX and Total Film, uh, I do get to write entertainment stuff. I get paid to write about Doctor Who. Yeah! <laughs> Whoa. Show I've been watching since I was eight years old. Yes! <laughs> Yes, but uh, I also get to write about mobile games in a way that will get people to pay attention to them because there's still a really big stigma about mobile games. Everybody thinks they're all, oh, it's freebie and garbage with microtransactions. Micro 
yeah, you just trust me. Let me let me put something in front of your face. You'll be fine. What you said about working with editors to become a better writer, that's something that is lost when you go the Patreon route. True. Because a lot of people, they decide, I don't want to work with an editor. I don't want somebody telling me what to write. I want to choose my own stories. But then they don't have a team supporting them. True. And you lose a lot of the synergy and collaboration that happens in a team-based environment. So, and that was on that Alexa said that you want to talk about. Yeah, no, um, so sorry to interrupt the flow with my thoughts. No, it's your turn. Um, no, the, the, most, the most valuable experience I ever learned was actually uh, while I was working at Polyon and writing features for Russ Pitts. Um, I was super cocky in like my first year like writing and I like really hated like getting feedback and I was always really cranky about it. And um, yeah, you when were, I, I was, heard stories. Yeah, man. I was the worst, I was the fucking worst. Like, I was, I was so used to, you know, being told like, oh, I like your writing's great, whatever, whatever. And then one day I handed in something that I just knew sucked. And, uh, and he didn't like, didn't like yell at me, like didn't say anything. He just looked at me and he said, listen, let me edit you. Let me edit you. And I said, okay. And I took a deep breath and from then on everything just got easier. And because of that one moment in time and letting someone edit me and like telling myself, okay, like I'm not perfect. Like this feedback is valid. Like, I've become a much better writer than I was when I started. So if you're on a team, if you're working at a website, if you're working with a small team, if, you're, if you have a Patreon, like have someone look at it before you put it up. Like I cannot tell you how invaluable that experience is. Like no one is perfect. Like the day you wake up and think, okay, my writing is perfect and I can't learn anything else, you're kind of boned. Like there's always room for improvement and there's always room to learn. Yeah, 10 years ago I was working on a piece and I sat down with the editor and she went through all these red marks that she had made. And every time she made a point, I interrupted her and explained to her why I had written it the way I did. And it was awful. And she got to the point where she just slammed the paper down, looked at me and said, Ken, you have to learn to listen. And it was, it was mortifying for both of us. And it was a life lesson for me. Uh, I've become a much better writer and listener and editor since then. And now when I get a paper back with a lot of red marks, I'm thrilled. Because that means I have that many opportunities to make it the better article that Susan was talking about. It's not video game journalism, but a great example of the power of investigative journalism, like Alexa does, and editing, like Susan does. I recommend the movie Spotlight, if you haven't yep. already seen it. Yeah. Great movie. Very powerful movie. So. And Holly, what is it that you love about your job? You know, I, I, over the course of eight years, I've had to take on a lot of different roles. I have, I have written so many different kinds of things over the years. I mean... I, you know, you put me in almost any role and I'm gonna adapt really well, whether it's a feature, it's a listicle, it's a guide, I write amazing guides, um, you know, in daily news reports, I love absolutely all of it because I love providing information to people. I love figuring out what information do they need, how are they gonna start looking for it, where, you know, finding a way for them to get a pass to that information, I, I just like it. If I wasn't a games writer, I probably would have been a teacher or a librarian, it's just something I love to do. So. You know, it's hard for me to choose between, you know, which I like better, editing or writing, you know, just because sometimes I feel like if I could just print out my employees' posts and just take a big red pen, I would just love every minute of it just like, you know, cutting it to shreds and giving that feedback and that guidance, um, giving other writers as they improve is incredibly rewarding. I got to see a lot of that over the past two and a half years at Game Ranks. Incredibly rewarding to find really great talent and to cultivate that. At the same time, the stuff that I write personally for myself is, is also incredibly rewarding. I don't know if anyone's here familiar with my work, but I write about depression, OCD, physical disability, um, you know, child abuse, all these different things. And every time I walk away, not only feeling like I shared a very vital, important part of myself through the lens of video games and our relationships with them psychologically through the avatar, but um, you know, I have people come to me and they say, this meant so much to me, so much to me. And it's like, there, that's it, that's all I need right there, to feel like people know me and that they've connected with my work and through video games and came out a better person for it or, or to have a significant emotional impact as a result. It's, you know, I could do this forever. So that's what I love. Wow. Yeah. It's so great that we get to do that. It is great. So there are obviously a lot of things we love about this job. I'm sure there's some, some things we hate, but there's also things that are really hard to do. You know, we may love them, we may hate them, but I would like to know uh, what is one of the hardest assignments you've ever had to work on, whether it was given to you or something you chose to tackle, and hopefully something that at some level you found satisfying, but was one of your greatest professional challenges. Anybody want to volunteer? Hey, I'll start. Go for it. You know, um, when I was with Destructoid, probably the biggest challenge I've ever faced as a writer was getting thrust into a situation that 
I didn't know where I was, what I was getting into. And uh, the new Tomb Raider had been just announced, and their creative director, uh, Noah Keyes, I believe, um, was the person I was meeting with. And I hadn't been told by Hamza Aziz that I was doing an interview, and I had never, ever done an interview. And I admit that to this day, maybe I'm not that great about it. You know, I have a little uh, hard time sometimes anticipating the questions I should ask somebody about that. But, you know, just got thrown in in the middle of it, and. Uh, and I managed, okay, and the piece that came out of it, um, you know, about Tomb Raider, examining kind of um, just the feminist aspect of, you know, the reboot of the entire series and some of the, addressing some of the criticisms and, and contrasting that with the interview that I had had with Noah Hughes and getting to the heart of the creative direction of the game and how much passion there was behind it and love for the game. Um, it, that was so, so, so hard, but had I not been thrown in it like that, I, it was an experience I really needed to have. We all need to be challenged like that. And, uh, you know, I made it okay, <laughs> but well, that was probably my worst moment, you know, most challenging moment as a writer. And you grew as a result of it. Yeah. And here I'm you are. <laughs> uh, Sam, uh, what, let's hear your story. Um, yeah, so this is kind of a, 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 a weird one, I guess. Um, th this is a thing where uh, I, I was, so I, I do a lot of copy editing and, and generally also, um, People tell me that my like my copy is pretty pretty clean, and uh, that's like really useful I think to people who who are editing me because they don't have to worry about like they or they feel like they don't have to worry about the technical stuff right like commas and things like that. But um, I think sometimes that tends to uh, when people are just looking over my work they kind of tend to maybe not look at it as closely. And so there have been times where like I've uh, like made factual errors or you know like things that. Or you know, kind of serious errors that, that maybe have, have uh, not been caught in in the, in the editing process, and then like something goes out on the page, and then like all the comments are like, "Hey, you idiot! What are you talking about?" And so, um, you know, a, a, a lot of like, I, I think we, we talked about it a little bit here on the panel, but like writers definitely can have an ego uh, and yeah, thank you. and think really? that their stuff is awesome, right? And so for me, a, a lot of the time, especially like earlier in my career, uh, when I was a destructor, I was like, oh yeah, like I'm awesome and my stuff doesn't need to get edited ever. Um, and then like that might be true from a perspective of like grammar, but when uh, you know people kind of don't look at your stuff as closely, uh, it's it's really challenging because then you know I feel terrible because I made a. a a mistake, a, you know, a factual error that needs to be corrected, and then we have to issue a correction. I have to talk to an editor about the correction process and, and all that stuff. And I also feel, you know, let down by the, the my team, right? Because it's like, oh well, you know, maybe that error wasn't caught because someone wasn't reading it as closely. So I think that that's the the tough part. Like you know, Susan was talking about the deficiency that we have in in uh, editing across our people. It's it's a thing that's that's. A, uh, an issue across um, journalism in general. I was just you know, reading about this the other day on, on Pointer. Um, and, and so I think what's what's really uh, the, the thing for me to like basically like learn to be more, much more humble about uh, looking over my stuff, not just for spelling errors, but also for making sure that um, I'm doing the best I can from a fact standpoint and also that I'm, I'm sort of making sure that people who are editing me are, are looking it over more closely. Great, thank you. Alexa, do you have a story to share? About my most challenging assignment? Yes. Literally every review I've ever had to write <laughs> because I hate writing reviews. <laughs> <laughs> Even if it's a game you like? Yeah, so I, I mean, especially if it's a, if it's a game you like. Because if it's a game that, that, you, that you like, you're gonna wanna, you know, so that people think, you're gonna wanna like slap a good score on it, right? If you like it. Um, or if you're biased towards it, it's your favorite franchise or whatever. I don't know. I uh, my thing with with writing writing reviews is I have met enough people in my lifetime and talked to enough other critics that like, well, we will never all be on the same page. Like, no game will ever be like a straight seventy or a straight fifty or whatever. Like, you get them all over the place. So when you know NeoGaf goes crazy because like Star Fox come out and Star Fox comes out and like some people are giving it like nineties and some people are not scoring it at all and it's sort of like. That's because every every critic is, is different, and I'm so exhausted by the discussion of the objective game review because it doesn't exist. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, because it, it doesn't it doesn't exist. Like it's uh, reviews are 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 a, a reflection of of the person playing it and their knowledge, which is why say 
we have Mike Mahardy, who's a writer for us, write Dark Souls because he's a Dark Souls expert, and why I review Fire Emblem because I am a Fire Emblem crazy person. Like, you, that's, you, you, you give them to the people who can best look at it through a educated lens. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason that I don't like writing reviews and part of the challenge of writing them is the aftermath can always be a little strange. And there's not, like, there's never been a moment in my life where I've, like, published a review and then maybe a day later been like, like, I'm not, I don't feel like I want to change, want to change it, but, like, you definitely think about it and you definitely, definitely second guess yourself. It's the only line of work in which, or the only kind of work in which I think about it and think, like, could it have been better? Could I have fixed something? Was I wrong about this? Was I right about this? Like, it's the only time I ever second guess myself, so I don't like doing them. Well, going to what you said <laughs> about the objective game review, Brandon asked, when doing a game review, do you think it's better to push your own opinion into the writing or to provide only the hard facts? I, what? what are there facts about what? a review? I mean, a review is personal taste. Mr. Rum Brandon? Hard facts? Well, if we're talking, what are we talking about hard facts? Like, you press A and you swing a, like, you swing a sword, like mechanically? Like a, review, <laughs> okay. a, a review that consists only of facts is, is a product listing, it's a is what it is. It's a, it's a product listing yeah. at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And if that's what you want, you can go get the press releases and sign up for their emails and get them all, you know, you can get those unfiltered any day of the week if you want. They will yeah. let you do that. Like, yeah, so. with reviews, I want to help people decide, like, okay, three games came out this week, which one is the one that I should be buying first? Like, that's essentially what reviews are, right? To help inform people what to buy, and inserting opinion or only facts, I don't, I don't, uh, no, I think, well, no. <laughs> and I used to have a newspaper column reviewing video games, and I would tend to review only the games I liked, not because I wasn't able to be critical, but because if there are 100 games out there for you to spend your money on, and I give one a bad score, okay, you've eliminated that one, there's still 99 for you to choose from. But if I give a game a good score, you can eliminate the other 99 and go buy that one. I feel like that's better advice when I review a game I like. Also, I hate wasting time playing games I don't like. So, yeah. Go figure. <laughs> Susan? Uh, Any tough assignments, or has it just all been easy street? <laughs> yeah, mine's a little different, and if you want to know how it really actually is, having a job as a game journalist, hey Susan, I know your team just had back-to-back -back the two best months in the site's history, Choose 30% of your team to lose their jobs. <laughs> I had to do that. You know, that was my, I had to go through a list of people and find six to make unemployed. We didn't do anything wrong. It wasn't our fault. We worked for a big company that had a shareholders report that was going to come out, and they needed to make numbers look a certain way. So they made changes across the entire country, or across the entire company. It wasn't just us. Everybody had to make cuts. But we did literally the best that that site ever had, and six people still lost their job. Yay, game journalism! <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's not unusual. That's normal. It yeah. Is normal. Yeah, I was an editor. I mean, that's a big secret: is nobody's making money, and nobody knows how to sustain a site. You know, it's it's almost a lost cause. There are very few places for anyone to have a paying gig, and yep. you're looking at, this panel up here, you're looking at people who have paying gigs, and it is by the skin of our teeth. We are very lucky to be in this position. Because mm -hmm. when I was at Game Ranks, guess what? I wasn't being paid very much. I had to fight for people to be paid a living wage. Not even a living wage. You know, the only person who's actually making a living wage at Game Ranks mm -hmm. is Jake Baldino. And we have one, you know, we had 1.7 million subscribers on YouTube when I left. Only person making a livable wage at that site. Uh, here's the workload at Game Ranks, you know, when before I got there and pushed for a better wage. It was $250 a month, six posts a day, five days a week, at least 1,500 words a day. That's four to six hours of work. Do you think that's worth $250 a month? It's not. And I pushed really hard for that to get b bumped up to 500. Guess how much I was making as the editor doing all the work I just listed on top of those six posts a day. I wasn't making any more than those writers. All right, and my editor in chief was making three times as much as me for less work. So that's the reality you're looking at. You know, you're not gonna make it in this business unless you have enough initiative to be a reporter, but also enough initiative to push hard, 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 hard when you know that it's almost hopeless. If you can't push hard enough with that initiative to make a spot for yourself, then you might not belong here, to be honest, because that's what we're looking for as reporters. You know, if you don't have anything important and new to say, you're not gonna get a position anywhere, and maybe you don't deserve it. You know, we have a lot of people out there who want to say games are great. What are you going to say that's new and different? And Susan and I had a really good panel at PAX Prime about getting into the industry and 
Um, if you uh, don't don't write for free, was number one because expo like value yourself. I think was number mm -hmm. two. Like if you you know want to do this and you're freelancing and you go to an editor, you know go in and say I am you know three dollars an hour or whatever it is. I remember, I you're freelance a long time ago. But if you're going to do this, you have to value yourself. And if you show the person that you want to write for that you value yourself, then they will value value you as well. So yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah, I used to be an editor at Computer World Magazine. Computer World's the same company that did Mac World, PC World, and Game Pro, all of which are now out of print. They're all just websites. Uh, I left that company three years ago because after six years, I was making as much as when I'd started, which was a living wage, but no raises for six years. And the three years since I left that and went into healthcare social media, I've doubled my income. That's how much more I make. The most money I've ever made from video games was my YouTube channel, where I have multiple videos that have several millions of views each. And I've made in the last three years $20,000 total across three years. That's about six to $7,000 a year, or $500 a month, which is about how much Olive was making at Game Ranks, or maybe even twice as much. So that's not a lot of money. Uh, but. So I've, I'm actually the only one up here who I don't think has done gaming as a living, games journalism. I do it on the side. But this does tie into the question of somebody asked, uh, we're all doing, like some people are doing investigative journalism, some people are doing five posts a day, uh, very different streams there, but we're all doing writing. And video has become very sexy yep. in the past few years. And even Because like, it's easier to monetize. Yes, it's very much easier to monetize. I mean, I mean YouTube takes, I think, uh, 45% cut, yeah. but they still give you quite a bit of money in my, in my experience. You have to make several millions of views, but it does start to add up. So where does video come into play if we are all writers? Are we going to be out of a job soon? Yeah. <laughs> I just got to yeah, write. I mean, you know, this took a dark turn. <laughs> yeah, ag boy. Again, if you legitimately want to be in this industry, there is stuff you need to understand about the way the money works, right? Mm. So ads on the website, don't do dick to put any cash in the pocket because everybody uses ad block, nobody's seeing them. You gotta get too many impressions to pay the bills. The ad rate for video, way higher and much harder to skip. So that is a big part of why the push is for video. Also, people don't wanna read no more. They're like, yep. oh, I've got yep. too much to do. Or also, alternatively, they just have it on in the background while they're playing Minecraft or they're playing yep. whatever, they're playing, doing other things. So a, if you want to increase your value, learn how to edit video. Yeah. Yep. Straight up. Yeah. Because YouTube and Twitch, that's the future. That's it, guys. That's it, you know? I really tried to secure my position over at Game Rank, so the only thing we could really do, you know, in terms of, we could see the writing on the wall. YouTube is coming, you know, so our channel is becoming so popular that at some point we were really figuring, the publisher's not going to even want to do the site anymore. What's even the point? And so we were trying to secure our positions by, you know, writing the content, writing that here's an idea for a video, here's the bullet points, here's some things that Jake could say. Um, eventually we got phased out of that so that we couldn't secure our positions there. But man, if you're a writer, I, I don't really see any other way other than starting to pursue video. I really don't. You know, you have to be a personal brand so much of the time, you know. And that's hard for any one writer to maintain. Most of us just want to write. We don't want to have this social media presence and streaming nights and all this stuff just to get people to pay attention to our careers. But what else are we going to do? And it's all futile at this point. So. so there is a place for writing, but you should prepare for the future as well. You need to be adaptable. You, you, need to, you, you just need always to need to be have adaptable. A, an array of skills in yes. your toolbox. Uh, be a person with a long camera, or know how to edit video, or know how to edit audio for a podcast write or know how to write scripts as opposed to writing news stories or reviews or features. You know, the, the idea that you're going to be just a reviewer, and forget it. Nope. That is, that is nope. no longer sustainable. Unless you want to do it as a hobby, you know, on the side, as a supplement. Then totally, absolutely, you can specialize like that. If this is a thing you want to do to, you know, pay your bills on a regular basis, you need a lot of skills because you are going to be asked to do a lot of different things. And the, the plus side of that is they're mostly really cool. They're mostly really entertaining and challenging and you'll get to do creative things and, and see your ideas, you know, and play with stuff and, and uh, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we tried this? And that's really, really awesome and fulfilling when it works out. So that's the upside of all this. And there is a place for journalism. I have a friend who used to work for 
uh, CIO magazine, and then she went for, for, to Information Week and got laid off from there. And so while looking for a full-time job, she decided to go into freelance. And she now makes $12,000 a year more as a freelancer because she's getting paid a buck a word. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. freelancers make <laughs> dope cash. That, that's how much I make Just as a freelancer. Saying. I, oh my god. I, what I, are you writing? I, I'm writing for IDG, for Computer World. I'm writing that <laughs> yeah, I mean, they do games at all. My friend and I were writing about enterprise IT, but yeah, the freelancers pay really well. Yeah, that's, that's the thing, like, if you will make way more money doing this same exact thing in another industry. Mm. You will. Mm. It won't be nearly as cool, you know, you won't, you know, you won't get to do rad stuff like get on a panel at PAX and, talk, and you know, nerd out over, you know, uh, uh, Overwatch or something, but you'll make a lot more money. And, and a lot of the skills are transferable. I learned to do audio podcasting at Computer World, and now I have my own two video game podcasts, which everybody on this panel except Timmy has been on, which is really cool. I, I think it's, it's the important thing is is to just always be open to trying new things in yes. terms of like expanding your skill set. So, like I started out, I was just doing like news posts, and then I was the only sports guy at Destructoid, so I started doing reviews. Uh, and you know those are really bad. Uh, don't please don't look them up. Uh, but um, you know then I got better, maybe. And then also <laughs> a little bit. And then and then I was on a podcast at Structoid, and and then um, at Polygon I've been like I said doing entertainment coverage, and also uh, doing video stuff. Like Alexa and I were both on this defunct video show called Speed Run that you may have seen. I miss it. I uh, like that show. That you was like my baby. It. Yeah, it was Alexa's <laughs> baby, and uh, like she wrote all the scripts, and and sometimes I, I was on camera, and initially I was terrified at the prospect of being on camera You're for adorable. an internet video. Yeah, it, it, I think like, <laughs> but that was that was something where I was really bad at it at the beginning, and then I kept doing it, and I got some modicum of experience, and like got a little bit better, and then we just did. Like we're, we're now working with like Facebook is doing their big Facebook Live push. So we, uh, I, uh, coworker and I, yesterday we did a like ten minute live stream talking about the the um, PlayStation uh, 4K, and so that was something where it was like just us sitting in like the director's chairs and and talking about the the, the rumors about that, and like that stuff that has been offered to me. But I also think it's really important for you to try to. Go out and, and you know if you're at a site, you know, try to try to uh, argue for being given those opportunities. So um, a thing that you may be familiar with if you read Polygon is that our, our features and reviews look really nice. We, we do a lot of work uh, in making sure that the layouts are uh, magazine-like and, and are really pretty. And I when I started at Polygon almost four years ago, yeah, uh, I was like, oh man, like. That looks really cool. I'd like to know how to do that someday. And for the longest time, I like never really asked about it. And then, at some point, I think I saw another coworker of mine, and and she had started doing review layouts. Uh, and I was like, oh, well, hey, Arthur, Phil, um, the Arthur Geese and Phil Kohler are reviews editors. I was like, hey, can I learn how to? Would you be willing to teach me that sometime? And they did. And now I do like a lot of our review layouts when they're you know really busy. And that's uh, a a fun thing because it's stretching different uh, muscles that I'm not when I'm writing. It's a totally different skill set. Uh, and that's only because I went out there and I asked to, to have that opportunity. And so it's really important for you, if, if you want to um, uh, expand your skill set, you have to be the one to, to try and do it. So we were talking about having diverse skill sets. Susan, did you want to talk about the soft skills? Yes, yes. OK, so hands up if you know what is meant by hard skills versus soft skills. OK, OK, cool. So hard skills are uh, things that you can kind of bullet point. You know how to edit video. You know how to write a script versus writing uh, a feature article, for example. Uh, you know how to take uh, beauty photographs of products. These are hard skills. Right? It's something you can go to school for, that kind of stuff. Soft skills are the, th all the things that go in between that govern how well you deal with how you de-escalate conflict, how you learn to communicate with different personality types, how you communicate to make sure that the person has both heard you and understood you, because people process information in different ways, and these are things you need to learn in order to be a 
cohesive working team. And it's the kind of stuff that no one will ever tell you in a performance review you need to work on. They'll just know you're not quite meshing with people and they will very rarely say why. They'll very rarely tell you, because you sound like a dick in your emails. <laughs> like that won't come out, but that'll be so, like the ability to write an email and sound like a natural person is a skill. And it is, it is a skill that not everyone possesses, but it is a skill that can be learned. <coughs> well, first I'm laughing at Chris. Oh, okay. yeah. Uh, but I'm also thinking about an, an incident I had at work last year where it was a very high pressure situation that if it escalated, could result in millions of dollars of lawsuits and people losing their jobs. Not good. No, and I dealt with it, but in the course of doing so, I wrote some emails that made me sound like a total dick. When I, when I should have just picked up the phone mm. and talked to the person, because I would have been better at that in that tense situation. And that, is, and that is a valuable thing to know. Like, I should have this conversation verbally, because if I try to do it via text, it's gonna spiral out of control. Mm. That is absolutely, that's an excellent example of, of a soft skill, knowing that about yourself or knowing that about someone else you work with. Mm -hmm. So when you need to resolve that conflict, okay, what is the best way to actually bring this down so that we are working towards the same goal as opposed to we're trying to win? Right, mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm gonna open up to questions after I ask one more question to the panel, which is what do you wish you'd known about this line of work before you started? Alexa? Can you, can you get back to me? Yes, Holly. <laughs> um, I think it would have been really good for me to know my own value going into it, that if someone isn't willing to pay you for your work, walk away. And if your work's not valuable enough to, to be paid for, then work on it. Um, know your own value. Don't let, you know, if someone's getting paid, you know, from the clicks on their website, that means you should be getting paid for your work. Don't let anyone push you around, you know? Do no harm, take no shit. That's what I wish I would have known. Thank you. So. Susan? Pass. <laughs> Do you want me to come back to you? Yeah, come back. Okay, Samit? Um, you know, we, we were talking about it earlier about uh, skills outside of writing. Like when I started doing this, um, I like had messed around with some video stuff for a project like my first semester of college, years before that, and had never really um, tried any of that stuff. Had, had never done like any on-camera stuff. Uh, and, you know, it's not that I, think that I'm like like way behind the curve and going to be out of job soon necessarily, although that may be the case. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I do wish that I, I had uh, explored that stuff uh, myself uh, earlier, you know, uh, in some, sometime in the previous uh, eight years or, you know, had, had started out with some kind of uh, background in, in that uh, arena because uh, I think it, it's, it's pretty much necessary at this point. Uh, and, and you know, I, I'm lucky that I have some other experience doing stuff like Photoshop and, and, and taking and, uh, photography and things like that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like, like, I was, like I was saying before, it's really important for you to, to do as much of that stuff as you can, and, and I, I wish I'd gotten into it earlier. Yeah, what I would say, and this is sort of a, uh, not quite that important, but it makes a difference, which is that time spent producing media about video games takes away from time spent playing video games. Like, I spend so much time producing my weekly audio podcast that I, I have not played a video game in, like, the last month. Oh. I know. Well, Get obviously, I've had other shit going on the past month, but okay, true. I, I could have really used video games this past month. I could have used that pressure release, but instead, I'm like, nope, I got a deadline. I got to stick to my deadline. So uh, it, I love having the opportunity to share this passion with people and have them donate and dedicate their time to coming on my podcast and trusting themselves and trusting me to talk to them. But I'd also really like to just have a Saturday where I don't have to get out of my pajamas so I can play video games. So, uh, Alexa? Okay, I wish that I had known that making a mistake is not the end of the world. That every time I made a mistake, the world was not ending and I wasn't going to get fired and people weren't gonna, weren't gonna come after me, whether it's publishing a headline with a typo in it or pushing something live or maybe saying, asking a wrong question and a wrong thing. Uh, because my blood pressure is so high <laughs> and I am so stressed out. Um, it's not, if you make a mistake, if you publish a, something with a wrong date, with a wrong, a wrong letter, a wrong name, like go in and fix it, make a couple and then move on with your life. Like it's okay and you're gonna make a lot of mistakes in this industry. Like people break embargoes accidentally and like do a lot of other sad things and it's, a, and, and it's okay. Like none of us are infallible and like 
you have to know going into this that like, yeah, one of these days I'm gonna make a mistake, but it's not gonna be the end of the world and I'm gonna be able to pick myself up and go on because you, you won't end up a stress mess like me. <laughs> so. <laughs> Susan. Uh, I wish, and again, I'm, I'm like the weird one here. Uh, I wish I had known that there was value beyond just being the writer because for so long I was agonizing over the fact that I was not the, as, a, as good a writer as, as these people that I looked up to, that, I, that these people that I worked with. I just didn't, like, the, the working 10 months on a story, I will never do that. I am just not that person. <laughs> I, I desperately want to be that person, but I'm not that person. I, I bring different skills to the table. I bring the ability to say, no, we shouldn't do that, and here's why is a skill that people don't have a lot in our industry. And, and don't value. And, and don't value, you know, the, the ability to check in with your team and make them feel valued and make them feel like they're human beings is again something that doesn't happen a lot in this industry. That has value. So I, I wish I had been, I had, I had appreciated what I brought to the table sooner instead of lamenting what I didn't. Thank I've you. always appreciated you, Susan. <laughs> Susan's my mentor, by the way. I'm here because well, that's of this not. wonderful lady. That's true. And I'm coming between them. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to spend the last 10 minutes with Q&A. You'll notice that there's no line for a microphone because I'm going to be walking around with a mic to address people who have their hands raised on one condition that you understand that a question is a short interrogative sentence that ends <laughs> in a question mark. <laughs> Okay, I have a question, but first I just wanted to say, comment on this. No, don't do that. So don't. We all know your life story, Susan. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> what is this with the warming up? What is this? Don't. <laughs> they are either on or off. I don't know what you did with yours, but mine's working. Okay. Right. So right. I'll be right. Let's switch. <laughs> <laughs> Something every video paper needs. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so I heard the words Fire Emblem earlier. One, what's your favorite Fire Emblem game? Two, Hoshido or Conquest? Uh, sorry, uh, Nor. What was your What was your favorite? What, what was the question? I didn't hear the second part. Sorry, could you stand? I just I can't really see you. Hello, okay. So I heard the words Fire Emblem earlier. One, what's your favorite Fire Emblem game? And two, for the recent games, Birthright or Conquest? My favorite game of all of them is Awakening. I know it's most recent, but I loved it a lot. And I'm gonna go with Birthright because I felt that, uh, so I played, I played both of them and Conquest really limits your ability to uh, do side quests and to spend more time with your units and to really build up those relationships. Like, I could get no one to hook up because I had so few opportunities in battle. So I have to go with Birthright. And I married Ryoma. I went right for my brother. Okay, who else has a question? Uh, let's go with the gentleman with the hat. Hello. Hello. Um, so this one I can take afterwards if it gets too complicated. But I work for a company called the Electronic Gaming Federation. And one thing we do is we build esports programs. And what we're trying to do is build the peripherals to that too. And part of that is journalism and media. So I was wondering if you had any recommendations for when we're building these programs for building kind of the media structure for it. Because we want to incorporate mentorship and we want to cultivate skills that you're talking about. And these are for students. So, you know, and we're building this from the ground up so we can kind of do what we want with it. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Peer review is a great uh, first step toward getting people over the hump of, I am critiquing your work, not you. And I am doing, I am telling you things you perhaps don't want to hear because I want to improve your work, right? And also, because it, a, what a lot of people do is they won't give critique because they don't want to hurt someone's feelings, or they don't. So peer review, if it's an ongoing monitored thing so that nobody gets too nasty about it, can be super, super constructive about building up critique skills, both giving and receiving. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. And by the way, everybody who has a question gets a Steam code for a Telltale game. Yay. Uh, young lady? I like Telltale games. <laughs> okay. I'm reading it, so I don't miss it. Um, so if, if you're already freelancing or working with uh, publications to get your word out, get your stories out, etc., what's the best route to go from there to an editing track? Ooh. Wow. Um, there isn't one currently because editing is not particularly valued. Uh, everybody really in our industry, it's, it's really not. not. It's not. It's not. Everybody in our industry is called an editor, whether they actually edit or not. I don't edit anything, and that's my title. And you're yeah, and you're an editor, <laughs> right? Um, so what I what I would recommend is if you are, let's say, you, you have a relationship uh, with a particular publication right now, do they need any help editing? Right, and try to so like uh, do some freelance editing for them, or you know, alternatively, like take on freelance editing jobs. I was actually just going to ask clarification. Yeah, I mean, for, for me valid. personally, the way I got my editing position was by making myself invaluable. I showed up at the site and within days was like, oh, this is a disaster. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to do this. Uh, the tons of stuff. Uh, you know, uh, our employee chat lobby, our employee email addresses, all these things. I started pushing for a new infrastructure on the back end. Pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing till finally Ian was like, "You should be my managing editor." And so that's that's what I did. It's just um, don't ever be satisfied for how things are. I'd love to connect with you afterward on how to handle you people that aren't open. Follow me on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter. Twitter. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you don't get all of them. No. Uh, to follow up on that as well, <laughs> I 20 years ago when I started in the newspaper industry, I was told by my editor, Ken, anybody can write, but someone who can write and do layout is invaluable. They're worth mm -hmm. their weight in gold. That's well, that true. was back when we had newspapers. What, nowadays, what, what's a newspaper? Nowadays, what I tell my students at Emerson is anybody can write, somebody who can write and load their content into a CMS is invaluable. So always have that complimentary skill, young man. Hi. Um, my name is Peter. Um, I have cerebral palsy, um, so I play video games one-handed. Um, I'm a PlayStation, PlayStation gamer exclusively. Um, and this question is about reviews. One of the problems I have is I buy a game and then I can't play it right. because the control scheme is just difficult. Um, so for example, in like The Witcher, when you use the touchpad to swipe up to get the inventory, um, that in battle would just keep happening. So you'd be in a boss battle. Um, and so one of my problems is reviews don't talk about accessibility. You're right. You're right that they You're don't. Right. That's a problem. Um, do, are you familiar with Able Gamers? Yes, I am. I love really it. Be, you should be reading everything they do and in touch with them all the time. Um, like what they do is... is so cool. my, my question is, do you or do your sites think about it more now that uh, like the PlayStation has custom button assignments, and Xbox has, you know, Xbox has been doing things. Um, because I mean, you, you, uh, Alexa, you talked about like three games coming out this week, and I read reviews, and it's like, well, can I can I play this? You know, it's something, and it's it's not a great feeling to buy a game and then figure out. No, you're absolutely you know, right. Yeah. You are 100 percent correct. And I think even someone disabled like myself, you know, I have a condition very similar to MS, and so that's why I'm primarily a PC gamer. Um, because controllers are, are very hard for me to use after a certain period of time. It's very hard even for me as a disabled person to remember that there's accessibility issues that need to be addressed. And that's something we always need to be uh, criticized on so we can take that into consideration. I mean, just now we're getting the awareness that we need to talk about, oh, are there colorblind options, yep. right? Yep. Stuff like that. And it's, it's so hard to remember even as someone who has those problems. But you know, you speak up, you talk to us now, and it's something we can log away and, and keep fighting for. You know, like I, I really love what Able Gamers is doing because it reminds me every single day I need to take that into consideration. Too often we put the burden on disabled gamers to just figure it out themselves with different controllers and things, and that's and there's uh, class issues there that 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 you encounter because not everyone can afford to do that. So, you know, um, I'm personally committing to being better about that. I'm not good enough about it. Yeah, Able Gamers is a nonprofit that works with developers to make the software more accessible, and they work with the players to make sure that the hardware is more accessible. There's also a group in the UK called Special Effect, which yeah. focuses on just half that equation. They work with the players to make sure the hardware is more accessible. They I, are awesome. Special Effect is great. They are awesome. 
Yes, so I highly recommend seeking out both of those resources. Even if you don't live in the UK, Special Effects has a website, so check out their resources. You get a screen for it. So we have time for like two more short questions or one really long one. So I'm gonna spend my time running all the way back here. <laughs> How's it going? Hi, you doing? I'm a senior editor of a website. My, everybody that I work, everybody that I work with, we're all over the United States, Australia, and the UK and Europe. How is it? Because I know, I believe, I know one of you. I'm trying to remember the names. But, uh, hello. Uh, I know you're dealing with people in the U.S. And you were dealing, you were dealing with people in the U.S. and the U.K. How does that like? Does that become cumbersome? And how do you deal with that hump? Okay, yeah, absolutely, that's a really good question. It goes back to the soft skills we're talking about because the ability to manage teams remotely, dealing with different time zones, dealing with different cultures, is a skill. It is something you have to aggressively work at because there's a whole lot of out of sight, out of mind, mm -hmm. and oh, well, I'll just send an email and that'll do it, yeah, right. Um, programs like Slack or, or to Discord. a lesser extent, HipChat yeah. are invaluable for, I, okay, look, it's not that bad. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, Slack would be would be your gold standard. That's going to allow you to uh, have, for people to comment at each other and A, feel like they're all physically in the same space. Even if it's a chat room, you feel like you're all together. And so you're talking like I'm talking to you as opposed to even though it's typing. And that can be a more personal communication than an email. Yep. So you can highly, you would change recommend. your entire team dynamic by having that communication constantly within a, within an employee lobby, right. a chat lobby every day. We were using Discord, which is great. Get the app on your phone, which means I was working 24 hours a day. <laughs> yeah, like I have. Slack. But it works. So. <laughs> yeah, like we use Slack. We use Slack because uh, our editor in chief is sitting somewhere over there. Uh, he did recommend that. But then also, what about those that don't? like to communicate? How do you kind of <laughs> work that out, you know? Your first task is figuring out why they don't like to communicate, right? Because you do not assume intent. Do not assume this person doesn't care or is being difficult or is a jerk. First, you need to figure out what it is about them and the way they process in the information and the way they deal with people that is leading them to not communicate. They may not have any idea that it's a problem. So that's where you need to start. Like, okay, here's, here's the thing, and discuss the behavior, not your assumption why the behavior is happening. Hey, I know you care about this site as much as the rest of us. It would be really great if you could be more communicative because that would be helpful. I noticed that's not something you seem to do a lot, and I was wondering if there was anything I could do to make it easier for you, right? Like your job is to give your team the tools they need to succeed, whether that's your attention, whether that's Slack, whether that's a conversation about why the F don't you write a goddamn email, what is your problem? <laughs> Baby, don't phrase it like that. All right, thank you, thank you. And this ties into a question we got on Twitter about social media. I had a student in my class last semester who wanted to get into video games journalism, but he is not on any social media and he refuses to be. And <laughs> Charlie Caldwell from iMore was our guest speaker that night and he asked her, is it important that I be on social media? And she <laughs> said, it's important that you know how to use social media. Yes. Mm -hmm. If you're not on there personally, you need to know how to represent the brand. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you need to know how Twitter works, how Facebook mm -hmm. works, even if you yourself are not comfortable being on Twitter. We have time for one more question. And you haven't done this side of the room. Yeah, you haven't. Yeah, 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 you're right. Actually, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to ignore half the population. Let's go right here. How are you, Stratton? <laughs> Hi. Um, <laughs> I'm a writer. I'm not a journalist. I'm a poet. Um, and I write like science fiction short stories. And I've slowly been working into like creative essays and stuff like that. But I find myself having to like put QR codes as titles of like Godzilla blowing up a building or something like that, and like I'm trying to incorporate technology into my writing, do you feel like that's just a place all writing is going in general, like having to use technology to the best that you can use it? I don't think you have to. I think it's a way to expand your user base and also expand your possibilities for creativity. If you look at it less as a burden and more of an avenue for new ways to express yourself, then it can be both useful and enjoyable for you. And who had a question that didn't get asked? Uh, yeah. uh, 
Did somebody in the front row have their hand up? Oh. Yeah. yeah, well, you don't get the question, but you get the same joke. <laughs> <laughs> And that's all the time we have. Thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of the weekend. Thank you.